Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club. I'm Mike Kalstrom, past co-chair of the City Club's Special Program Committee. Today's forum, the Mike Michelson Special Forum, is a unique event. It is unique because it's dedicated to a unique City Club member. Mike Michelson had a special talent for challenging others to defend a proposition by taking a contrary position, often sharpening everyone's understanding. He often practiced this talent as a member of my committee and among friends and colleagues, some of whom may be attending today. Those of us who were regularly taken to task by Mike were honored to help sponsor programs that memorialize his many contributions to our collective search for the truth. So with that in mind, it's a great pleasure to introduce someone Mike would have relished challenging, Mickey Edwards. <laughs> Mr. Edwards is vice president of the Aspen Institute and serves as director of the Aspen Institute's Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership. He was a Republican member of Congress for 16 years, serving as a member of the House Republican Leadership and as a member of the Appropriations and Budget Committees. After leaving the Congress, he taught for 11 years at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and for five years as a lecturer at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. He has also been a visiting professor at the University of Maryland Law School and at Georgetown University's Public Policy Institute and a visiting lecturer at Harvard Law School. He has been a regular political commentator on national public radios, All Things Considered, and a weekly political columnist for the Chicago Tribune and Los Angeles Times, as well as other major newspapers. His articles have appeared in magazines ranging from the Atlantic to the public interest. His current role as a thought leader and comment in his current role as a thought leader and commentator, Mr. Edwards has come to be known for critiquing the system he used to lead. His most recent book is called The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. The title speaks for itself in many ways, but in this era of political gridlock, fiscal cliffs, government shutdowns, and a level of partisan rancor that is unpleasant at best and dysfunctional most of the time. We're very glad Mr. Edwards is here to explain a bit more about what he has in mind. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mickey Edwards. Right. I, I don't know how to use a lectern. I don't know how to stand still, so I apologize. Uh, I, I am really more thrilled to be here than you might imagine uh, because I, I was learning just a little bit ago that the City Club was, uh, was formed in 1912, which was the same year that my mother was born in Cleveland. My father was born in Cleveland in 1911. Uh, the, um, Matt, when, when I was teaching at Harvard, uh, I, I, I was doing this NPR co commentary and did a commentary every week, and I could talk about whatever I wanted. And, and it was uh, you know, often about politics, but didn't have to be. So one time, because I wanted to talk about what was on my heart, I talked about the Cleveland Indians. And, <laughs> and I, got, I got this, this is not going to be a test, but uh, I, I got this call from a professor in Florida who said, I'm going crazy. You know, I, I love the 48 Indians just like you do, but I can't remember who played right field. You all remember who played right field? Kennedy. Who? Kennedy. Kennedy for a little bit, Pat Seary, mostly Walt Judnick and Allie Clark. So I just, uh, you know, I, I could name them. So I, I mean, I'm thrilled my, uh, my, my uncle, who uh, was head of the, the Accountant Society, Public Accountant Society in Cleveland, uh, had his office a couple blocks from here. So, uh, and a couple of years ago, we had a family reunion in Cleveland, and I took 20 members of the family from all over the country to an Indians game. So, uh, I, I'm, th this is home, and I love it. I'm glad to be back. Uh, well, we, uh, we politicians often don't need a microphone, but, you know, I know you guys do. So, the, the book... Uh, it, as, as you heard, the, it, the book is called The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. I didn't write that second part. Uh, the, the book started with an article in the Atlantic Magazine. And when I saw that the, they had put the title, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans, on the article, 
And, and I said, that's really pretty harsh, isn't it? I mean, I know lots of Republicans, Democrats, they're all good, honest people who care about things. They said, well, did you read what you wrote? <laughs> and so, um, so I'm going to be talking about what I wrote and, and why I wrote it. And it was something that started in my life years ago as a member of Congress. Uh, I would go back and, and have meetings with my constituents in Oklahoma City on a regular basis, a lot of meetings. And one time, uh, there were a couple of hundred people in, in the meeting, and somebody asked me a question. I don't remember now what it was. Uh, and I gave the answer you give as a politician. I said, well, I'm a Republican. The Democrats control Congress. We tried to do it. I wanted to bring this up. They wouldn't let me do it. The Democrats are the ones. And somebody stood up in the back of the room and said, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Republican this, Democrat that. Everybody in the room stood up and cheered, and I've never done it again since. <laughs> and, and so that, that's really what, what I want to talk about. Uh, I gave a talk not long ago to the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And at the end of the talk, somebody stood up. I always have these people stand just like you all are going to do, stand up and say something about it. And they said, ah, you're a systems engineer. Well, I, I never thought of that. But yes, I'm a systems engineer. And what I want to talk about is the system. So if you wonder why in Washington, especially in Washington, you, you find it a big story in the papers if somehow Republicans and Democrats actually sat down together and passed something, you know, that they actually worked together. Worked very well. Uh, can you hear me without it? No, we need to hear Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> so, the, the, the Democrats, well, the problem is, is the mic. The, the Democrats caused this. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me do that. I don't need to hear it. You know. yeah. okay. You want this back? You might have to take off the tie. <laughs> yeah, why am I wearing a tie? You know, I came here to go to ball games. Where was I? Uh, if all of you who are sitting here and love the City Club, as you would with this great history and what you've done, decided that you wanted to do something for this club, you wanted to get a new facility, you wanted to expand it, you wanted to have meeting rooms, you ha wanted to have more uh, technology, you wanted whatever, here's what you would do. You would all get together and you'd appoint a committee or whatever, you'd, you'd sit down together and you'd say, where are we going to put it? What do we need? How big does it have to be? Not one person in this entire room would say, let's divide into separate clubs that will each be out to defeat the other one and try to get it done. And we don't do anything like that in our lives except the way we run our government. Dividing into separate clubs whose primary goal is to defeat the other club. It's, it's more like the Browns and the Steelers than it is a government of the United States. So here's why that, you know, in technology or anything else and in your businesses, whatever system you create, determines the outcome you are going to get. And we have created in this country a political, not a constitutional system. I love the Constitution. I love, I, I, I love the kind of system that our founders tried to create. But we have created a political system that works completely contrary to the Constitution and to the democratic ideal. So let me give you some very specific examples. When Barack Obama became president, Joe Biden became vice president, and so there was then a vacancy for the U.S. Senate in Delaware. Uh, is anybody here originally from Delaware? Okay, I gotta be real careful. I don't wanna insult people, but uh, 
they had an election. And everybody knew who was going to be the next senator from Delaware. His name was Mike Castle. Mike had been the governor. He had been their uh, congressman. Uh, he was the most popular politician in the state after Biden was gone in, in Washington. But he had to run in a primary. That's the way we do it in America. He uh, had to run in a primary. And a lady named Christine O'Donnell, I don't know if you remember her. She's the one who famously declared that even though she did attend witches' covens, she was not really a witch herself. Uh, Christine O'Donnell won the primary. There are one million people in the state of Delaware. She got 30,000 votes. So what's the logical question? Well, then why didn't Mike Castle just run against her and trounce her in the general election, which he would have done? I'll get back to that. In Utah, the same year, Senator Robert Bennett was running for uh, renomination for another term in the U.S. Senate. In Utah, they start with a convention. And in that convention, part, you know, party conventions, just like party primaries, tend to be dominated by the people who are the most partisan, the most ideological, the most hardline, the most I will never compromise ever in my life about anything. They dominate primaries and conventions. And in that convention, by 320 votes, Robert Bennett was not able to even go on to a primary. He was eliminated by a margin of 320 votes. There were 3,400 people in that convention in a state of 3 million people. So why did he not run in the general election? And, you know, first of all, i got to make this. Let me back up and say this. If you ask people on the street who's the head of government in the United States, almost everybody would say the president. No. No, not we don't have a head of government. We have three separate equal branches, except every major power of government is in the congressional branch. The power of spending, taxing, going to war, who sits on the Supreme Court, what treaties are approved, who sits in the president's cabinet. Every one of those is a congressional decision. If you create a system where the majority of the people are not able to select who sits in Congress to make those decisions, you have undermined the whole democratic idea of our system of government. So why did, why, why did Bennett not run in the general election when he would have won in Utah? Why did uh, Mike Castle not run in the general election in Delaware when he would have won? Because it would be illegal in those states if you, lose, if you seek your party's nomination and you lose in the primary or the convention and you don't get the nomination, no matter how few people participated, your name is not allowed to even be on the ballot in November for the people to choose among when they're deciding who's going to decide on war and peace and taxes. And you know what? It's not Delaware and Utah. It's 46 states, including Ohio, that no matter how few hardliners participate in a primary or convention, they are able to control access to the ballot and keep off the general election ballot, even those people who would have been the choices of the voters. So I, one other example of this, because it just, I, I, by the way, when I say this, I don't care about party anymore. I don't care which party. So. And I don't care whether, I'm sure there are some people in this room who think that the, the temporary shutdown of the government, part of the government, was the worst thing that ever happened, and other people who thought, thank God, they finally did it. But, and I don't care which side you're on, but I started wondering, how did Ted Cruz get to be a United States senator? So here is how. And, you know, I don't care if you think he's good or bad. I'm not, I don't have a position on that. How did Ted Cruz get to be a United States Senator? He had never run for office, never held office. He ran in a primary against a guy named David Dewhurst. David Dewhurst, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas. And Dewhurst clobbered him by more than 10 points. 
but he didn't get over 50%. They had to have a runoff. And in the runoff the, uh, of the $10 million that Cruz spent in that campaign, $8 million came from outside sources, poured into the state. He won in the runoff, as a result of which David Dewhurst was not allowed to be on the general election ballot where he would have won. How many votes did Cruz get? 631,000 votes in a state of 26 million people. That's roughly 1 44th of the state. And because of that, in every state in the union except for four, you are able to be kept off the ballot in November. So what happens? Look at the primaries. What's the reward system? Isn't everything that you re what you reward is what you get and what you punish is what you don't get? What do we reward in our system of choosing who can even be on the ballot? Incivility, hard line positions, refusal to compromise. That's what wins you the nominations because people don't have to worry about what all the people in Ohio want or all the people in Kentucky or all the people in Oklahoma or whatever. You know, they don't, all they worry about is how do I keep happy the people who show up in the primary in those states like Texas and others that whoever wins the party nomination. You know, no Democrat was going to win in Utah. No, no Democrat was going to win in, uh, uh, in Texas. So whoever wins the nomination, you know, that's it no matter how few votes. So, okay, I'll skip on to another part of this because I know we'll get to Q&A and the clock keeps ticking and, you know, I lost part of it talking about how much I love Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> I'm a city guy. You know, I, I'm from Cleveland originally. Uh, then I grew up in Oklahoma City, which is the same size as Cleveland. Uh, I'm, I'm this total city dude. Uh, and after I won election, I'm a Republican who won in a district that had not elected a Republican since 1928. And 74% of the people in my district were Democrats. Now, I didn't know how I won, and my mother didn't know how I won, but I won. Uh, and they tried to defeat me and kept trying, and they couldn't defeat me. And so what did they do? What can they do? They redrew the congressional district lines. And so Oklahoma, Ohio would fit nicely into a tiny part of Oklahoma. It's a big place. Uh, and my district in Oklahoma City, right in the center of the state, uh, they redrew my district so it went all the way up to the Kansas border and halfway across to Arkansas, a big upside down L. And because I'm a politician and we're all self-referential and it's all about us, you know, I kept talking about what they did to me. They didn't do it to me. There is a provision in the Constitution, maybe the single most important provision, that every senator and representative must be an actual inhabitant of the state from which they are elected. So when you elect somebody from Ohio, they have to be from Ohio, and you have to know them and know their reputations, and they know you, and they know the economy, and they know your problems. Here's what happened. In order to, because they couldn't beat me, they decided to put every Republican they could find anywhere into my district, make all the other districts safer for Democrats. By the way, Republicans do exactly the same thing. Every time I mention one or the other, both parties are equally bad at every bit of this. So they redrew the district, and now what happened? It wasn't about me. I'm the city guy. I'm wearing penny loafers. You know, I, to me, food, food comes from a grocery store. And now I was representing tens of thousands of wheat farmers and cattle ranchers who were entitled to be represented by somebody who understood them. I didn't understand a thing about their livelihoods, about agriculture. That was done because it benefited the parties rather than the people. And the one result of that was that in my district, because they put all the Republicans in, my district became much more right wing and they took them out of the others, and they all became more left-wing. And then you try to say, why can't we all get along, and why can't we work together? So I'm only gonna, I, I want to talk very briefly about a couple more things before uh, we, we get to the Q&A. Uh, money. Um, I know some of you are lawyers. I'm a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, 
Uh, but I, I don't know, in, in Citizens United, I mean, I don't know what the justices were smoking. I know it wasn't legal. Uh, in, it is in Colorado, but uh, what did they not understand? I mean, even if you grant that it's a possibility that the justices of the Supreme Court know something about the Constitution, <laughs> what don't they know? You're, this is your, your field. They don't know corporate law, which makes very clear distinctions between corporations and people. But we, we have this system now where, you know, money, all this tons of money comes pouring in from outside, from a few wealthy people for, or from PACs, you know, and you don't know where the money's coming from. So I have, I'm only going to say this quickly, I, I have the most extreme proposal in my book of any, so I'm an extremist, so I'm, I have an extreme proposal. When you go to vote, there is absolutely nobody in line with you to vote except other human beings. And if contributions are a form of your political statement, it's like voting with your money, then there should be no money except from human beings. No corporate money, no labor union money, no political action committee money, no, you know, no, no, mon no political party money. Just reportable, transparent, limited contributions from individual human beings so that we can drive this pushing of, of ideologies out and let people sit down and talk about the issues and let conservatives and liberals sit down together and say, where can we find the overlap? Where can we find the common ground? Where can I give some so that we can keep the bridges from collapsing and we can keep the drugs safe and we can keep the water pure and we can keep troops getting the equipment they need so that we can function as a government? So let me, let me switch quickly to another. Um, how many of you have ever been to Washington and been on the floor of the U.S. House? Any? All right. Wow. So here's a question about what's, what's different between the, uh, the way the U.S. House works and right here. There is a podium here, right? Well, lectern, right? Always is, even for people like me who don't use it. Uh, there, there's always a lectern. You go to various meetings all over. There's a lectern. There's not a lectern on the House floor. Did you notice that? There's two lecterns, one for Democrats, one for Republicans. And when I first gave my talk, uh, my first talk on the House floor, I was so full of myself. I just knew I could be persuasive. and So I stood at the one. Okay, you guys are all the Democrats here. Sorry. I'm sorry, Matt. But <laughs> you, you all... You, you, you turn this here, and I'm talking to the Democrats because I thought I could persuade them, right? There was a gasp. There really was. This is a gasp. No, no, you have to stand over here at the, at the, the podium that is for Republicans because you'll get cooties if you touch a lectern that somebody in the other party touched. <laughs> there are... You cannot smoke on the House floor. You can't have a sandwich on the House floor. You can't read the sports pages on the House floor. You have to go off into the cloakroom, but there's no cloakroom. There's a Republican cloakroom and a Democrat cloakroom. They don't even check on the baseball scores together. And that's true in every committee. When you have, when you elect the Speaker of the House, every Republican votes one way, every Democrat votes the other way, and so what do we have in our elections? You have speakers in the House and majority leaders in the Senate who are not legislative leaders. They're party leaders. And their agendas are not to bring things to the floor, to have free and open discussion and see how you can pass legislation. It's how can you advance the agenda of your private club. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. First of all, most people are shocked. Political science people are shocked. You know, the speaker doesn't even have to be a member of Congress. But in, some, in, in Britain, you can't become Speaker of the House of Commons without a certain percentage of your nominations coming from somebody in another party. Same in Canada. So we have created, my, my bottom line here, and, and I'll wrap this up, we have created 
a system. It's not the system the founders designed. It's not the constitutional system. It is a political system that we have created that rewards intransigence, you know, punishes compromise and civility, and that's why we have the results we have. Now, I'm not trying to get rid of political parties. I belong to one. This is a democracy. People have right of free association. And for, you know, strong opinions, that's, that's what the democracy requires, debate about strong opinions. But there is something wrong when we create a system that allows small numbers of people to control who can be on the ballot and that says city dudes who don't know anything about agriculture are representing farmers because it helps the party. That system doesn't have to be that way. So I, I'm, I'm, I will be asked what can be done about it, so I want to end on an upbeat note. Some of you will disagree with this, because I know a lot of people disagree with it. Uh, I see this problem, but I'm not the only one who sees the problem. In 2006, the people in Washington State looked at what was happening, and they said, to heck with this. And they got rid of party primaries. And they got rid of party control of redistricting because those redistricted lines in 37 states are drawn by whatever party controls the legislature. So Washington State got rid of party control of redistricting or party control of access to the ballot. And now in that state, I know people tell about what they think is wrong with it, uh, and it may not be the perfect solution, but in Washington State, every qualified candidate runs on the same ballot Every, every qualified voter votes on that ballot. They can choose among everybody who's qualified to run. If nobody w- gets uh, over 50%, the top two finish could be two Republicans, two Democrats, two Greens, two Libertarians, a Green and a Libertarian. Who cares? It's not about clubs. It's about looking at the candidates, l- sizing up their intelligence, their abilities, and deciding who you want representing you. So Washington State set against, by the way, there is something that brought the parties together. The Republican and Democratic leadership in in Washington State fought like crazy against it. But the voters said, no, we're tired of party control of the system, and they changed it. 2006. 2010, California did it. California doesn't have party primaries. California doesn't have uh, party control of redistricting. Now, maybe there are other solutions that are better But that's better than what we have, where it's club against club for whatever is to the party advantage. So that's the argument in my book. I get into a lot of other pieces of this, committee assignments. You know, how do you get a committee assignment in Congress? It's actually pretty easy. You know, if you have some seniority, it doesn't matter if you have the most seniority, you you promise two things. One is you're going to support the party position in what comes before your committee. You pledge before you've read a bill, heard a witness, you pledge that you're going to support it, and you will raise, if there are several of you who want the position, whoever raised the most money for the party. So today, Republicans and Democrats alike have to raise $300,000 a year on top of their own campaign funds to contribute to help knock off members of the other party. So that's kind of the problem I see. So when I say how to turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans, I don't mean that either Republicans or Democrats are not honest, caring, compassionate, people who love America. They love America. They're trapped into a political system that punishes them for working with people who have a different point of view than their own. And so that's what we need to change. We need to get them to function as Americans sitting together just the way all of you would function sitting down together as members of the city club. So anyway, let me stop there. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dan Maltrip, Chief Executive here at the City Club of Cleveland. Today, at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum featuring Mickey Edwards, Vice President of the Aspen Institute and Director of the Aspen Institute Rodell Fellowship, I- Fellowships in Public Leadership. We'll return to Mr. Edwards, Congressman Edwards, in a moment for our traditional City Club question and answer period, and we encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that those questions should be brief and to the point. 
We welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many other radio stations ac across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club of Cleveland are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Next Friday, August 8th, we invite you to join us as we welcome Sari Feldman, Executive Director of the Cuyahoga County Public Library and President-Elect of the American Library Asso Association. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at our brand new, spanking new website, cityclub.org. Today's program is the annual Mike Michelson Special Program, established by Mr. Michelson's family, friends, and colleagues. We also want to recognize Art Brooks and Robert Belenker for their dedication to the establishment of this program. Thank you very much for your support. Now, oh, yes, indeed. Thank you. Now we return to Congressman Mickey Edwards for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding, microphones, holding the microphone today is just Kirsten Pianca because the Congressman stole our other microphone. <laughs> Kirsten is our marketing and outreach specialist. Our first question, please. Stand still? Yeah, I will. Okay. <laughs> Congressman, the, uh, th first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation, but not only entertaining but very informative and a great summary. Uh, the experiences in Washington and California, how did they deal with the problem of redistricting, which was also controlled by the parties? Oh, good question. And by, by the way, uh, before I answer, let me just say, you know, you can throw anything at, you, at me because uh, – I grew up in a kind of a pugilistic household. My dad was a, a Golden Gloves boxer in Cleveland, but one of, one of the other boxers in the Cleveland Golden Gloves was a guy from London named Packy East, who later changed his name to Bob Hope. So, uh, so you know, we're, you know, I don't know if my dad ever actually fought Bob Hope, but they were in the Golden Gloves at the same time together. So uh, I, I, I skipped over it in, in the, uh, because of the time. In, in both of those states, they also changed the redistricting and turned it over to nonpartisan redistricting commissions There are that are independent. There are now 13 states that have done that. So 37 states, you still have the states, uh, whoever controls the state legislature draws district lines. But in 13 states now, uh, the independent nonpartisan redistricting commission, they're all different. You know, they, they function in different ways, and I don't know if there is uh, – one better than the other, but that's how they've done it. They've just taken it out of the hands of the legislature. On, um, Capitol Hill for Wes Watkins. Oh, when you great. Were in Congress. Are, you, are you from Oklahoma? I was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right. And I heard you were mesmerizing at the Foreign Affairs Committee and <laughs> Club in Tulsa. Um, what is happening to our state of Oklahoma? Do you think they're going to cede from the union? <laughs> how did we get that way? I mean, how did we get from Wes Watkins and Glenn English and Jim Jones and the people from Oklahoma that served with you in the 80s to Governor Mary Fallon and where we are now? I think that um, you, you could point to Oklahoma, you could point to Texas, you could point to Arizona, you could point to a lot of different places, um, and I give the same answer I did in my talk. If you changed how people got on the ballot and you got rid of the closed primaries, that's not what it would look like. Take Arizona, which probably has the worst reputation of any of the states, uh, uh, and that's because if you look at the people, one, one of the people who's in the program that I run and that Matt's in and, and other, you know, um, is the mayor of Phoenix. And he's a uh, moderate to liberal Democrat. And Kirsten Cinema, who is another pe person in our program who's a liberal Democrat who's uh, uh, in Congress now, they, they elect people like that in Arizona when they can. But what happens is the primaries are, are control who can move on to the general election. Uh, and so uh, a lot of what I certainly know that what happens in Oklahoma, which the state I'm very familiar with, uh, is that. Uh, the people who might be able to appeal to a broader audience, be answerable to the broader electorate, don't get out of the primary. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned on several occasions today at the City Club that you are a Republican. I am indeed. 
being a Republican today is a little more complicated than just saying I'm a Republican. Yes. There's a Tea Party organization which to a certain extent has taken over the Republican Party and certainly in the House of Representatives it's a very, very significant factor in the deadlock that we have today right. and in part of the reason why uh, there's so many uh, things that do not happen. So when you say you are a Republican, uh, how do you feel about the Tea Party uh, and its uh, role in the Republican Party? Is there room for both, or is, there, or is the Tea Party going to take over the Republican Party? Well, there, there's certainly not a, a friend of mine, uh, a professor at Harvard who I taught with there, uh, wrote a book about the Tea Party, and I wrote a chapter in it You know that uh, – pointing out the Tea Party is not nearly as strong as people give it credit for. It has exactly the effect that you're talking about, but it has that effect because it's able to turn out the people in the primaries with small amounts. The Tea Party candidate I, I mentioned, Christine O'Donnell, you know, there were only 30, she only got 30,000 votes. The other people didn't show up and didn't vote, didn't participate. Same thing that happened in, uh, uh, in Utah, where, but there it's a convention. And the party leaders, you know, basically control the convention. And those tend to be people who are, you know, the most active and the most ideological. But I don't think at all that the Tea Party is representative of where the majority of Republicans are. And if you look at the national polls about where Republicans stand on a lot of issues, including gay rights and, and other things, Republicans are not that far. They're more conservative than Democrats, but they are not that far off. You know, so the Tea Party is not representative, but they can control the process. So it, it's, it's who, it, it, the, the voice of the people, my argument is, that the voice of the people generally is not the voice that's being heard because of the political system we've created. Hi there. Um, I have come to learn uh, through some doctoral research that I'm doing on how legislators lead, that uh, within that, one of the most proud moments of every legislator that I've interviewed is their ability to cross over the aisle when they could and work with um, a member of the, uh, um, the opposing party on a piece of legislation. They also tell me that they can't do it very often. Right. Because as you mentioned before, through the party, that they won't get appointed to a chairmanship, they won't be able to have any kind of, you know, leadership role, because that would be looking, uh, they would be looked at as disparaging their party or not supporting them in some way. Um, and I just think it sort of wraps up a lot of what you've been saying about the party divide. Do you, can you speak to this um, issue a little bit? And if you think that there's ever a way that they can work across aisles without being punished, if you will, as I'm summarizing it to be? Well, if you have the open primaries, where because here's the way the open primary works, or, or I, call it, I call it a general election with a runoff. Uh, they had an election in, uh, in California where two very liberal Democrats ended up as the top two, Brad Sherman and Howard Berman, and they were running in a very, very liberal district. There was no way no re that a Republican was going to win in that district. They ended up as the top two running against each other. Previously, they would have both been appealing to the as far left as they can to, to prove their liberal credentials more than the other one would. Now they knew that the Republicans were also going to be choosing and the Libertarians were going to be choosing. And so they broadened their appeal. So uh, that is one way. But, you know, it, it's part of it. Survival is a strong instinct. And people, you know, so wh why do people who hold public office uh, you know, do so much to survive. Well, you, you get a, in Congress, you cannot uh, have any outside earnings other than your congressional salary. So if you're a lawyer, you give up your law practice. If you're a doctor, you give that up, or your CPA, whatever. You give it up, and so you find yourself, you know, 40 years old, 45 years old, you have a family, you're not really eager to lose. And what you find out is that you're, you can get knocked off in the primary, so you see these kinds of examples. You have Orrin Hatch from Utah. He's a conservative, but very well known for working across the aisle. He and Teddy Kennedy worked together on a lot of things. All of a sudden, when he saw what happened to Robert Bennett in the Utah uh, you know, convention, you know, he started moving farther and farther to the right. Dick Luger, who had a lot of reasons why he lost in Indiana, but Dick Luger started moving farther and farther to the right. Mitt Romney, right? You know, when, when, when you... The Mitt Romney who ran for president was not the Mitt Romney who served as governor of Massachusetts. Uh, and it's because uh, 
the, this threat of the people, the, the, the tail wagging the dog, the hardline partisans who control the nomination system, you know, can take you out. And that's, so that's what happens. Uh, that's why you have to open it up so that every candidate has to appeal to the entire electorate. And I think that would, I mean, there may be more than one way to do it, but I think that would change the outcome. Uh, Ohio is almost a 50-50 split between the Republican and Democrat. Right. Yet, the um, vast majority of uh, Ohio senators and congressmen are Republican because of gerrymandering. My well, I mean, Sherrod Brown may not agree with that, but, you know. But, I mean, that, but that's the statewide versus yeah. the congressional. Yeah. I'm talking about the uh, Ohio, uh, the Ohio legislature. Uh, Ohio okay. legislature. Um, my question to you is that how d they control the Congress or the state legislature. How are they going to avoid getting, letting us make the changes? And the second part of the question is, I mean, h practically, how do you so get very, Ohio very or question. California did it? Very good and question. Second part of that is the Republican Party. I asked this to Senator Portman, who was here a week ago, I believe, that Republicans have become anti-party. Everything is anti-gay, anti-Hispanics, uh, anti-immigrant. Why is it because of the Tea Party movement that has become so strong that they have to be that way? Well, first of all, let, let me say in. in um, in terms of, of how the party has moved that way, if you look at the national polls that Pew does and other organizations might, uh, other organizations do about the feelings of Republicans nationwide, they're not that different from, from where Democrats are. So that, that's not the problem. It's the ones who, you know, as again, dominate, you know, the system, you know, uh, in the primaries and conventions. Uh, the hard part, look, I, I don't know you, you all will know about Ohio, uh, the Ohio Constitution. In, in Washington State and California, the state constitution allows initiative petitions. Basically, the changes were made by going around the politicians and going to the people. And 24 states allow initiative petitions. And the people just get the signatures, you get, the, you get somebody to help fund drafting it and, and getting advertising and you get volunteers to get signatures and the power of the initiative petition is amazingly strong. Uh, I don't know about Ohio, uh, but I know that a lot of other states that don't, the other 26 states, a lot of them have various kinds of referenda systems. You know, whether you can either have a direct referendum where you, where you can get it relate, you know, sent directly to the voters or an appeal referendum, you know, that after the legislature votes you can uh, appeal it. I don't know what it is here, but you know, for a lot of you know, if if not, if it can't be done through a uh, referendum or petition, you you have the single strongest weapon you've got, people power. So I don't know who your representative or senator is or what party, uh, but if he or she shows up at a town meeting and you want something like this referred to the people, you know, or changed, you show up with all your friends and your neighbors and the people from the city club, and you say. We want these changes made in the way you operate, and this is where we're watching to see if you do it. And if not, well, you're afraid of primaries, we can get together a primary. So, you know, I mean, the, the people have to speak, and that, that's one way. Hello, is there any uh, evidence that these reforms that have taken place in California and Washington, and apparently two other states you haven't named, well, is Louisiana, there I, there's only one other. Oh, uh, one other? Okay. Um, is there any evidence that polarization has lessened in the states that have made these nonpartisan primary uh, reforms and, and redistricting reforms? Um, because the proof would only be if, if it's measurable outcomes. I, I don't know about Washington State. The New York Times had a big story about as a result of all that happened there, that in California there's a lot more uh, people working together across the across the aisle, a lot more success in bringing things uh, together in a bi in a uh, bipartisan way. So you know, not on everything. I mean, you know, we're, we're there's 312 million of us, and we have very diverse views, uh, but um, it it has changed because you have to appeal now. Has it increased turnout? It it should. I don't know whether it has. This only happened, you know, a few years ago. But um, 
the, the California result is the only one I know. And the New York Times said it has made a difference that they are acting in a much more uh, bipartisan way in California. So. I was going to ask you who played right field for Cleveland in 54. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm sure you know Dave Philly's name. Politics, in my opinion, have changed back from. When I know I the wrong guy was playing right field for you know, uh, uh, you know, against the Indians in '54. Uh, <laughs> guy, you know, I, I think Willie Mays could have stumbled on the way back. You know, would have been, uh, anyway. Uh, Don't remind me. <laughs> the um, politics, in my opinion, have changed dramatically from when I was growing up at, up in the '50s. There tend to be more compromise between yeah. Democrats and Republicans. They would scream and shout, but ultimately there would be compromises which were entered into. You had Democrats who were liberals and Democrats who were conservatives. It was a different system and a different feeling. How did this change come about? Uh, it's sort of hard to know exactly how it came about, but let me give you uh, some examples. Uh, first of all, to back up what you said, uh, Medicare, uh, civil rights legislation, things you know that look back and say, well, that was really controversial stuff, you know, were passed with the majority of both Republicans and Democrats, uh, and it, it was very common that you would come together uh, and work. But things have changed. Um, the primary system did not really grow. I mean, John Kennedy, when he was elected, you know, ran in very few primaries. Uh, I don't know that Hubert Humphrey ran in any primaries. Uh, you know, so what, what happened is as the system changed and you went to uh, uh, that, that kind of a, a, a showdown in the primary system, the gradually people began to say, uh, the Freedom Works, for example, Dick Army, who I served with in, in Congress, and people at Freedom Works began to realize, well, you know what? We don't have to appeal to the entire electorate. You know, if we can just go out here and win the primaries, you know, much smaller audience. And they caught on to it, and they've started doing it before. In the, in, uh, the days you're talking about, uh, Jacob Javits lost in a primary in, uh, uh, in New York, and, and uh, Clifford Case lost in a primary in New Jersey, but it was very rare. You know, nobody had really said, that's how you can win these ideological battles is in the primary system. And people just finally caught on to the weakness in the system and, and exploit it. Congressman, hello. Thanks for your comments today. Uh, I'm Jack Shaner, the Deputy Director of Ohio Environmental Council. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan environmental advocacy group. And I patrol the uh, halls of our Ohio State House. And you're absolutely right on of the polarization today and the influence of big money. I uh, look forward to reading your book. But we have a the spirit of uh, minority uh, interest here, and you like pugilism, so there's a very, very <laughs> vigorous disagreement we must present here. This young lady in front of me, I'm going to yield my time to her. Okay. I was at the 1948 World Series. <laughs> <laughs> first, first base, Eddie Robinson. Absolutely. Second base, Joe Gordon. Right. Shortstop, Lou Boudreau. Third who, base, who won the Kenny Championship. Kelton. Right field, Dale Mitchell. Center field, Wait, Dale Larry Mitchell Doby. from Oklahoma City, by the way. Yes, go ahead. Larry Doby, center. Hank Edwards, left field. Catcher, Jim Hegan. Pitcher, Feller, Lemon, Bearden, Gromek, Wynn. Kleiman. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good for you. Wow. <laughs> it feels so good. I mean, first thing I did last night was uh, go, when I got to the game, uh, thank you, Matt, when I got to the game, took my 12-year-old my grandson, uh, and first thing we did, now he, you know, he's, you know, his parents grew up in Boston, uh, so I had to uh, take him and, uh, you know, we got him a Kipnis jersey, we got him a C hat, we did, you know, now, I think we got him now. <laughs> and and my, by the way, I shouldn't say that my wife is in love with uh, with another man, uh, but most people think you know Brantley's first name is Michael. She calls him my Brantley, so uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Also, thank you for the for the for the interesting talk. Um, 
My, my question is really um, about your contention at the start that you support the Constitution and, and are really talking about a political system. When I look at it sort of as somebody who looks sort of outside the U.S., I really see it as a, as a problem of our Constitution, that we have flaws in the Constitution that we simply s continue to support. We, for example, give lots and lots, we give the exact same amount of representation to states that have less population than Cleveland, and we have a system really that is set up that really leads to these kinds of, these kinds of problems that you've identified. Historically, for example, we've had these problems all uh, for, for long periods of time. It, it, whether you look back to the period following the Constitution when it was signed to 1800, certainly to the 19th century, it was extremely visceral and contentious, and the kinds of things that you're describing were much worse then. Um, in the period of the 1950s, a lot of political scientists would argue that was sort of a very rosy period, in part because of the war, because of the enormous growth that the U.S. had experienced. It was easy to get along when the pie was growing. You know, it's nice to get along, but when the pie is not growing, it's hard. And historically, when, my question is, when, besides the 1950s, what part of U.S. history do you point to and say, hey, I wish we were like that? The, um, there has always been a lot of discord. There always will be. As I said, there's 312 million of us, and we're very diverse. Just look around the room. We're, we're very diverse and have strong opinions. What was missing, what, what's missing is not the strong opinion, but the willingness to sit down at the end of it and have a compromise and, and find a common ground. That's what happened in, in those days. So it wasn't a magical period. Throughout the history, and you go back, you know, to the confirmation of some of the most controversial justices, Brandeis, Frankfurter, you know, one after another, you get people who are getting, you know, confirmed unanimously or almost unanimously uh, for the Senate. You know, so th this has been, we, we've always had, I'm not saying there's not going to be division. My God, we're a democracy, you know, and I want us to have strong feelings and fight them out. What's different is that at the end of the process, you have to sit down and find out how do we move forward. And that's what's missing. So in terms of, uh, you know, I, I don't have a particular feeling about um, the, the, the Senate, uh, you know, where, you know, Delaware has as many senators as Ohio, when you probably aren't upset that Ohio has as many senators as California. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it was a compromise that was reached. And it was a compromise so that because you had states that had different kinds of industries and agriculture and other things, you know, that you would have a system in which those smaller interests or those outlying interests would not be ignored so that you can't have somebody just run up huge numbers in big urban areas, you know, and control the outcome of the elections. You know, if that happened, people in Ohio would have a problem because they'd be, you know, Ohio would not become suddenly necessary. So, um, I, I, you know, it's not perfect. It's, it, the, the Constitution itself is full of compromises. Yes, sir. As a former legislator, I'd like to get your perspective on the change in personality of people who are in the legislator, legislation now because we've had a change in the personality and uh, how they basically deal with people, and they're being challenged more and more. And the incumbent is no longer safe. So what do you think are some of the changes that have been uh, exhibited in the new people who are coming into government? What are the changes that they're experiencing? I, I don't know that, I don't think the people themselves who run for office and get elected are different than the people who always did. Uh, but it's who determines their fate. You know, it's what they, what positions they have to take in order to not get wiped out during the primary process. And when they're in office, what positions they have to take to be able to stay in office. You know, I mentioned about getting on committees. I don't know about the state legislatures, but getting committee assignments. You know, a committee assignment is very, very important to not only your success in Congress or in the legislature, you know, but to, uh, it's your reelection, but it's how well you can serve your constituency. So the reward system you know, is, is punishing people who are acting the way you and I would like to see them act. And if we created a 
system. Well, wait, you know, I'm, I'm going to get offline here, but I, I, I'm going to say this anyway. So what the hell? You know, I say that uh, if we created a system where the people rewarded good behavior, where the people rewarded civility, and the people rewarded compromise, then it would change. And what does that require? I don't know how many people I'm going to offend by saying this. Uh, it requires working on our school system so they teach civics and they teach critical thinking. Uh, it works, you know, uh, it, it requires a lot more city clubs, you know, a lot of places talking about what you all do because we've allowed, you know, to some extent what you have is, is legislators that are representative of the communities. They come from and what those communities value and what they know and what they reward. And so uh, fixing the system is not as simple as writing a book and saying, make these three changes and it'll get better. It'll get better, but it won't be perfectly better uh, until we make some other changes ourselves. And what does that mean? It means, you know, reading the plain dealer or back in the old days, the news and the press and, you know, uh, uh, as well. Uh, and, you know, not just reading whatever blog happens to uh, echo your, all, your preconceived opinions. I mean, it's going to take cultural changes, too. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a Friday forum featuring Mickey Edwards, Vice President at the Aspen Institute and author of The Parties Versus the People. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This program is now adjourned. Thank you.